pray and work. Well, greetings, everybody. It's uh, it's always good to have men and women of their word. Virtually everybody that said they were coming came. Hey, and a couple that I didn't even know about. Uh, we're going to uh, start this first of a three-week series on uh, intercession, intercessory prayer. <clears throat> and uh, I think everybody, I, I know everybody in this room to a certain degree, some people like this lady, I, I just met her for the first time tonight, but we probably all have prayer lives. And uh, prayer lives, we have prayer lives. And we probably have all had an experience of the love of God in our lives, okay? And uh, we have some familiarity with the Holy Spirit. But my premise of everything is, do you think we've got it all? Yeah. Does everybody think they've got it all? <laughs> Scripture says if you think you're standing, but watch out, you're going to fall. <laughs> because we will. <clears throat> We're trying to get our arms around infinite mercy and compassion. And that's going to be not only a lifelong venture, but it's going to be, I think, an eternal adventure. Because once we're in heaven, God willing, and we're face-to-face we're -face with him, um, I, I, I'm sure that things are going to continue to unveil for us. Uh, in our prayer meeting many years ago, the St. Anthony prayer meeting now is into its 43rd year, and uh, we, not, we, we may not be smart, but we're stubborn, and we just keep on coming. <laughs> okay? Um, I was thinking about the scripture that says, uh, in the end, three things endure, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And I was saying, well, what does endure mean? Maybe endure means that they last beyond time and space, okay? And if they, if they last beyond time and space, and faith is the confident assurance of things hoped for, and the conviction of things unseen, I gotta say it's gotta be a total revelation for all of eternity of mercy and grace and compassion, and we're all going to be, we're going to, when we're there, we're all going to be filled to the degree that we've emptied ourselves. And there's going to be no competition, like there should be no competition today. We should be collaborating, okay? So if God's given me enough grace in my life to empty out a cup worth, and he gave you enough grace to empty out of ourselves a quart or a gallon or 55 gallon, we're all going to be full, but we're all going to be equally happy and we're all going to be glad we're there. And so that's sort of, we have to look at each other right now, is that we've all got different gifts, and people are, you know, God speaks in the mode of the hearer. He'll communicate with you, hopefully tonight, and in your own prayer life, in a way that you can understand. Um, it's basically the same message, but we're all unique. As Charlie Osborne would say, we're unique, one-of-a-kind masterpieces of the living God. So he's got things for you to do that he's got for nobody else in all of creation to do, because we're all unique as our fingerprints, as unique as our DNA. They say every snowflake is unique. I mean, the creativity of the creator is, is amazing. And you know, it says in, in one translation in the, in the scriptures, it said, uh, you, your sins will be as white as snow, but the real translation is whiter than snow, because every snowflake forms around a dust particle. So it looks good, but still at the center, there's something that's like a little bit dirt, <clears throat> you know. And probably if we're all honest, and I've been at this longer than most of you, um, I, I thought a lot of stuff was cleaned out, but the Lord kept on telling me, no, there's another room, there's another room, there's another room that has to get cleaned out. So I just realized we're on a journey, and we're all in some place, and we're all listening together. We're a, a pilgrimage as the body of Christ. And wouldn't it be good to really encourage, upbuild, and console one another? Which is the definition in scripture of what, what prophecy is or what a prophet is. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that is as we go on. Um, I have a, a ministry card um, that I created. Uh, it's, got, it's got a scripture in it. It's got a, 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 a saying from uh, Pope John Paul II, now Saint Pope John Paul II. He said, we are not the sum of our weaknesses and failures. We are the sum of the Father's love for us and our real capacity to become the image of his Son. See, that, that's, that's what life is about, is manifesting the image of his Son. Yes, John? Could you say that again? Yeah. 
I'll give you my card. <laughs> it's got it on it. I'll give it to you. No, you got we are not the sum of our weaknesses and failures. We are the sum of the Father's love for us in our real capacity to become the image of his Son. You see, who we really are. See, the world's told us who we are. The devil's told us who we are. The flesh has told us who we are. And I look at the flesh as me and all my relatives. Okay? You may have some flesh in your family, too. But what's important is what God has told us about who we are. In Scripture, through the saints, through the teaching order of the church, and I think what we're, we're all doing in, in some amount of light is trying to fulfill the goal in our lives. I mean, I was in business for a long time, and, uh, you know, they always said you had to have a goal, but if you don't know what your goal is, it's hard to achieve the goal, isn't it? Okay, so what is, you know, what is our goal as Christians? What is our goal as human beings? To get to heaven. To get to heaven, but what, is, what does that mean? To grow in virtue. To grow in virtue. And to grow in virtue, to me, means we are in union with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we've allowed his purpose and his empowerment in our lives to live a life on the face of the earth as fully as we possibly can. We know some people are deemed saints. Mother Teresa was called a saint very shortly after her death. Not that many people. John Paul was close after his death. But they were recognized because when they walked on the face of the earth, something was special about them. Something was recognizable about them. Something fulfilled what Jesus said is, though you know, they'll know you're my disciples because of the way you love one another. Because they demonstrated his love. Um, I have the privilege over the last, well actually, it's longer than I thought. You, the older you get sometimes time doesn't, you don't recognize time so much, but um, I, way back in 2003, I started going to this priest and I went to him once every about 18 months or every two years or something like that. He gave me enough um, for that whole year to, to chew on. But uh, uh, he was Mother Teresa's last spiritual director and he was actually mentored by Padre Pio. He was the spiritual son of Padre Pio. So he was a pretty amazing guy, still is, in the mid 90s, traveling all over, training priests and exorcists. He's a retired exorcist. And he told the story about Mother Teresa that she wanted to form uh, a home in the Vatican for homeless people. And real estate's really hard to get in the Vatican. And the guy, that, the cardinal that was like in charge of it, he, he wasn't giving her no property. <laughs> so she said, well, I know John Paul II, let's go and talk to him about it. So she and her sisters are driving over to see the Pope, and she sees a guy by the side of the road, and uh, you know, he's, he's destitute, he's dying, and she had the, the car stop, and she went and started just loving the guy and ministering to him and being with him. And her sisters were saying, Mother, we gotta go and see the Pope. Mother, we gotta see, see the Pope, and she said, that's all right. Tell, tell him I'll meet him another time. You go see the Pope. Tell him I had to stay with Jesus. See, because she wasn't just intellectualizing that. She actually saw in faith Jesus in that person. And wouldn't it be something if God could open our eyes that we could see Jesus in one another? And, and I know it's, it's a lifelong journey, and I know it's a struggle, and I know Scripture says... In the Old Testament, they journeyed in stages and they moved line by line. And the New Testament says, we're being transformed from glory to glory into the image we behold, and it's the work of the Spirit. So I know we don't get this in one big fell swoop, but there's probably points in your life where you think something shifted and you understood God a little bit better. You knew his love a little bit more. I think we need lots of people that are really open to experiencing the love of God and that's where our hope comes from. In Romans it says, and hope will never disappoint us because the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So hope and love and the Holy Spirit, they're all intertwined with our walk on the face of the earth, probably more than we realize. More than, you know, I've realized in my long journey. And uh, I grew up as a Catholic, uh, Sicilian household, went to Mass, said the rosary, had a big Bible on the table that nobody ever read. You never had one of those, you know, the really pretty, but nobody just opened it up and read it. You know, we need to do that, we need to read it. But um, 
I, I didn't until, you know, I was in my mid-20s, I had an encounter with Jesus, and it's the whole story in itself. But I began to understand, you know, I had just graduated uh, uh, from Harper College, which is now SUNY Binghamton, with a degree in philosophy. And, and, and the, uh, the classical definition of philosophy is studying the underlying principles of reality. And when I had my adult conversion, when I actually met Jesus in the Spirit, and I got baptized in the Spirit, and the Scriptures opened up, I read in Corinthians where it says, the reality is the body of Christ. And I said, why am I studying Hegel and Kant if the reality is the body of Christ? So I said, that's good, you know, it had some value, but there was not real life in it. I need to go where there's real life, and I devoted myself from that point. Now, we all learn at different paces. And I have to admit to you, I'm a very slow learner. And we all have things within us that interfere with us hearing and understanding and putting into practice the Word of God. James says, don't just be hearers of the Word, but be doers of the Word. We have to do it. It's good to hear it, it's good to know it, but it doesn't do any good unless we do it. Blessed are those who hear the word of God. We're saved by faith, but blessed are those who do the word of God, who implement the God, word of God. Our blessing comes in doing. It's like uh, what James said. Remember, James said, uh, uh, you show me your faith, I'll show you my works. Based on faith. Based on faith. It was just a reading this last week in Mass. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so... We're, we're to the point right now where, you know, the world is in an uproar. It's always been in an uproar, but I, th I think my read of it is evil is not trying to hide anymore. It's not trying to disguise itself anymore. It's just full tilt showing itself. And um, in order to combat that, we need to have a church that really prays. Now, we know statistically from surveys the people that call themselves Catholic, 30% of them go to church. But Father Ken told me, and then I heard it on a, 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 a webinar I was on by some people that are very deep in the spirit, and they, they, called, the, uh, they called out the, the, the uh, uh, survey that found this out. Of the 30% of the Catholics that go to church, only 31% of them believe in the real presence. So I say to the Lord, if Pope Benedict said the church would get down to a remnant and you'd build off the remnant, we can't get much lower than we are right now. Mm -hmm. So folks, we're it, I think. <laughs> you know, I think in the natural mind, I know me, I wouldn't have chosen me. And I know Wayne, I don't know if he would have chosen him either. But he has chosen us. Isn't that wonderful? He loved us and he chose us. Okay? And each one of us, he's, he's, he's an equal opportunity employer. And he could... You know, if we, who wants to get in, who wants to go to heaven? Everybody wants to go to heaven, right? You know, who lives in heaven are the angels that stayed with God and the saints. So to, when we're in heaven, we have to be saints. And how do we get to the point of being saints? That's, that's the whole thing. Um, I, I was looking over my, my journal in preparation for this, and I started memorializing things back in 1993. And I, and, I, and I pulled out some stuff that he said to me that I thought was relevant today. Um, and w one of the things uh, I went to, uh, Father Maximilian used to be up at Mount St. Francis. I don't know if you remember him. He was a rector up there. Really, really great priest. I went to confession to him one time. It was about self-will. And he said, St. Bernard said, what burns in hell is self-will. If we die with no self-will, there's nothing to burn. <laughs> You know, if that's even remotely true, I'm glad purgatory exists, and I think it's a great mercy of God, but I think most of us have enough difficulties in life that we don't have to really go there. I mean, if we have to go there, it's nice that it's there and we can go there. But I don't know about you. My plate is full with problems. And you wouldn't even, you wouldn't want my problems. I probably wouldn't want yours either. But my problems are sufficient for me to get me holy. Because, because of the sacrament of baptism, the sacrament of confirmation, and of the Eucharist, and matrimony, those, Father Stephen was my first spiritual director, he says it's like, he puts a, a 
a guard around you, and because of the grace of sacraments, you bounce off of that, that wall, but it keeps you back and going to the same thing. So you, you can run away from you, all your problems, but you just get another problem. It's like they used to have that old song, you know, I want another drug. Something to make the pain go away. You know? But all those things, what, what, all those drugs, whatever the addiction is, and there's many kinds of addiction, none of them solve the problem. All they do is mask it. So when we accept Jesus Christ and when we're baptized, even when we're infants, and when we're adults, we have to make the ratification of those baptismal vows made for us because we didn't know what we were doing when we were babies. Okay? In baptism, we died and we rose with Christ. That's the reality of baptism. Monsignor Asif, the priest I was talking about, I heard him say one time, he didn't understand what happened at baptism until he was 23 years old in third year th theology. He said, what a waste of 23 years. Most of the church has wasted a lot of time because they don't understand what happened in baptism. It's profound. We became new creatures in Christ. In, in Greek, the, the, the actual translation is a new species of being. We're not of the world anymore. We're in it. And the world, the flesh, and the devil wants to keep us diverted away from our call to holiness. Because when they've got us diverted and confused, and they've got us in anger, and they've got us in fear, and they've got us in anxiety, and they've got us in worry, we're, we're trapped. We're in a prison. You know? And like Peter, and like Paul and Silas, they were in prisons too. It took an earthquake to shake them up so they could get out of those things. And God will put an earthquake in your, in your life somehow to wake you up because he loves us so much. He wants us to be free. And it's a long story. I'm not going to go into it. But um, in October 17th, 2001, from my journal, the Lord told me, pray that St. Anthony's Parish come alive in the Spirit. That's 20 years ago. Okay. Uh, in May 19th, 2002, he told me he wants to fill St. Anthony's with the Holy Spirit. And then he started telling me about how I would have to live with this and, 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 and cooperate with it. He said, Frank, my word holds no false hope. This is October 1st, 2002. You will, however, be challenged to live out those things you prophetically declare. It scares the absolute snot of me to stand before you and try and tell you the truth. Because I understand that if I'm not trying to live it and, and, and getting the grace to live it, it's scary. It's really scary. It, it, but, but the thing is, is over these last, you know, I had my adult conversion the Friday before Mother's Day at 10 o'clock in the morning in 1973. I can tell you exactly what happened in the room, who was there and what happened. Okay. I've been trying to understand and live this thing out low those many years. And what happens is we go, it says, when the law of Moses is read, uh, a veil is over their eyes. But when they turn to the, when you turn to the Lord, the veil is removed, and all of us together with unveiled faces, gazing upon his glory, are being transformed from glory to glory into the image we behold, Jesus, and it's the work of the Spirit. So we go through stages, and we go through levels of freedom. Uh, a, a good friend of mine in Owego many years ago was a prophetic guy, and uh, this was like in December of 2003. He told me, you're in a dark place, you're headed out, you've gone through several doors already, there are more to go through. Over one is entitled, it doesn't matter. When you get out, there is a light-filled meadow with a waterfall. Mm -hmm. Jesus is sitting on his stone, and you're going to sit next to him. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know any, how many more levels of freedom I need to experience. I can't even begin to judge that. Like Paul says, my conscience is clear, but I don't know what I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I told the Lord, you know, you've got to have cleaned out the basement. He said, no, man, there's many subfloors to the basement. Mm -hmm. okay? But I'm telling you, at this point, he's led me out of so much darkness that... 
by his grace, it's the only thing I'm saying, it's all grace, it's all grace, it's got nothing to do with my abilities, he's got me to the point where I've been able to dismiss anxiety, I don't worry, and I'm not afraid. And that is not the case in my life. I have my mother's side of the family all has PhDs in worrying and anxiety. And I had to work myself out of that, okay? But something has happened where he's put it up, and that's why I believe all the stuff he's been saying to me for the last 20 plus years, really 40 years, is imminent right now. And I think that's why uh, we're going to see a, a change, because we have to have a change that changes the culture of our country. When our, a lady of Guadalupe appeared to that gentleman, and he got the roses, went to the bishop, and all that kind of stuff, when they believed and they built the basilica, Mexico had what was the equivalent of a new Pentecost. 3,000 people converted every day for 10 years. And what, what was a marking of that? They used to do human sacrifice. They stopped doing human sacrifice. We, we do human sacrifice in a way. Okay? Maybe. Hello. Come on, Mary. Come on in. Welcome. We have the hardest working woman in show business just arrived. Uh, Director of Evangelization for Syracuse Diocese. Mary and her. Regina. Regina, how are you? Mary and her Regina. <laughs> so, I think that we're all on the cusp of something where, and it's all the grace of surrender that we need to in order to go whatever the next step is. Now, I don't know about you. But there's been blockages in my life where I wouldn't hit it every day, but I'd cycle around and I'd hit that wall, and I'd cycle around later on and I'd hit that wall. I never could get past that wall. I don't know if you got walls in your life, but there, you know, something I didn't understand. I didn't understand how to get out of that. Now, a lot of what I understand about intercession came from Mother Nadine Brown, who was just the best on intercession, spiritual warfare, and healing that I, never, I ever uh, sat under the ministry. And she said that in 2001, I went to a retreat Father Regis Rota had put on up in Skinny Atlas, and she taught about the only prayer that's always heard is the prayer of Jesus at the right hand of the Father. My Father always hears me, he says. And we know by Jesus' own word and what the scriptures say that Jesus is the one that intercedes. And intercession is like a big umbrella that we're called to join with him in union and intercession in relationship with the Trinity with the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So intercession is like a big umbrella where all this stuff in the spiritual life is mixed together. And it's not, it's not a minor call. Uh, Jesus, in Hebrews 7.25, it says he's always able to save those who approach God through him since he lives forever to make intercession for them. Now, if on the face of the earth, what did he do? He taught, he healed, he fed the sick, he raised the dead, raised, he freed people from demons. All good stuff, right? He told his disciples to go out and do the same things. But now he said, it said he's been given a far more excellent ministry, the ministry of intercession. My mother used to tell my mother always to say to me, Don't be satisfied with anything but the best. I didn't know what she's talking about. But I'm beginning to understand what she's talking about. She was an intercessor. She died early, but she was an intercessor. And um, I had good parents, thank God. Didn't mean there wasn't a bunch of stuff that came down my family line that I had to un unlearn, but <laughs> we all have that. Yeah. But there was a lot of great stuff that came down too. You know, and they gave they gave me an example. Uh, so he's at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven. In another place, in Colossians 3, 3, 3, it says, our lives are now hidden with Christ and God, high above every principality and power. Do you understand? Because we were baptized, when we accept Jesus Christ in, a, in our adult life, which is ratifying what happened to us in baptism, like St. Louis de Montfort said, Our spirit was instantaneously changed. We were born again, if you want to use that term, and that's a scriptural term. Okay? Our inner nature, we're body, soul, and spirit. We're made in the likeness and image of God. And it says God is spirit. 
Our spirit lives forever. Everybody's spirit lives forever. But it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to live in the presence of mercy and compassion. Not that God doesn't want everybody to do that. He says, I will that all men should be men and women should be saved. But there's some people who will make an irrevocable decision where they're going to cut themselves out. God doesn't send anybody to hell. We choose it. Strange as it might seem. And we choose it because we're deceived, we're wounded, we've been lied to. All this stuff that's been packed on top of us. And um, I'm going to tell you one, one quick story. Uh, and intercession is like, yes, Jean. I'm sorry, Frank. Going back to um, you know, Jesus being the intercessor now, you're talking about Correct. Does that mean Jesus is interceding for that particular thing, assuming that it's a good thing? Well, here's the thing. We pray through Jesus to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the motion. Okay? And when it says, in my name, and that was, in fact, that was coming up in one of the things I was talking about, we have to understand in Hebrew what name means. Name means it's the totality of being. I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with saying, I pray in the name of Jesus. Okay? That's not, there's nothing wrong with saying that. But it can be a magical thing. The name of Jesus is, he loves his enemies, he prays for those that persecute him. If they steal from me, he doesn't ask it back. That's the name of Jesus. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He justified them when they killed them. That's in the name of Jesus. That's being united with them. You see, we've, we've learned all these words, and they're good words, and I'm glad we know the words. But there's a power behind the word. And the power is and the power of the word is opened up to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why next week we're going to talk more about it. The two functions of the Holy Spirit in baptism and in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Same spirit, but one is forming character and one is forming us for service. Both are critically important. But if I'm going into the kind of battle that we're in right now. I don't want to say, well, I'll take this weapon, but I don't want that weapon. I want every freaking weapon I can get. I mean, I just climbed out of some deep, 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 deep places. And I don't know how many more places i got to go to, but I'll tell you what, I have no desire to go back. <laughs> I have absolutely no desire to go back. And every moment, it says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but they're, they're enormously powerful, or one translation says they're full of God's enormous power, demolishing every stronghold, the enemy strongholds, and everything that raises its head in pretension against the knowledge of God, experiencing God, taking every thought captive in obedience to Christ. Okay? So this level of freedom that I just sort of got ushered into by mercy and grace, mercy and grace, mercy and grace. Frank had no idea how to get there. God just said, hey, why don't you come over here right now? He told me about five or six years ago, just keep your eyes fixed on me, the Father. He says, don't worry about what's going on to the left or right. If I want you to stop and do something, I'll tell you about it. But just otherwise, just keep on coming to me. Keep on coming to me. I want you to get out of the darkness into that bright field, okay, where Jesus is sitting on the wall. I go over and sit down with him. And I don't have to be afraid of nothing. And he told me how to... Did, did he not tell us, don't be afraid? Father... Ken said that it was the most used phrase in the scripture 365 times. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And how many people are afraid on the face of the earth right now? How many of us have fear in our lives? Okay? I'm just telling you don't have to do it because he said don't. Are we going to believe his word or are we just going to have it's going to be a fairy tale church? The fairy tale church ain't going to do it. Maybe you're here to hear this and maybe this is just too crazy for you. But maybe some of it is going to just jaunt you into another place. He said, dismiss anxiety. And he also said, don't worry. Wow. What is he? I've lived long enough that I've come to this basic conclusion that the Trinity are not jerks. <laughs> they don't tell us something unless they've got the grace to give us to be able to do that. 
but it's not automatic and I can't get him with McDonald line prayers. I got to go into prayer and I got to listen. I got to, you don't know how, nobody can teach you to pray with God. You got to hear his voice. You got to listen to his voice. My sheep know my voice. I talked to this lady, this was like 30 years ago or something, maybe even more. I thought she was a spiritual woman. I was talking about how important it was to hear God's voice. Isn't that a dangerous way to live? And I said, isn't it a dangerous way not to live? But, in fact, I just had a guy, he wanted to come tonight, but he can't come till next week. But he says, here's, here's a question. It's one of the things I'm going to speak about next week. How can we tell the difference between our voice and the voice, God's voice? It's a gift of discernment. You ask God to show you. And, this, and God's voice will always line up with the scriptures. It will always line up with the teaching order of the church. And it'll always line up with that inner voice that you, look, you start to learn to know it's his voice. And he'll give you, you probably have had examples of this in your life. Um, uh, one of my first examples of hearing him, uh, uh, when I knew it was true because it panned out, uh, this was back like in the late 70s, and uh, I had a restaurant that we, that we had to close down, and you know, I had to go to work. I went to work on a machine at EJ's and sort of built my career through that for over 27 years. But at that point, we had decided, I think we had um, two children, and we decided we, we wanted, we should go buy a house. I had absolutely no money. But, you know, like on the day of Pentecost, they all began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we have to begin, and he comes in and he helps us. That's how you speak in tongues. He enables us to speak in a language that's not of the earth. And I'm telling you, it's awful powerful. Next week you get more about that. But, so I hear this, I hear this voice, I'm in prayer, and the Lord, the way I started to hear him, and that was the same voice that I sort of heard and heard and heard and heard over these last 40 years, and I started to recognize that voice. He said, Dr. Max is going to help you with your house. Dr. Max is a PhD that worked at IBM, very brilliant guy. He worked at the, on the atomic bomb, I think. He was just like really brilliant. Loved the rosary, loved the Holy Spirit. And I was teaching at that point, and he just really liked what I was teaching. I've been teaching the same thing since 1973. Hopefully it's getting a little clearer, but I'm understanding it better. He didn't give me any, I, 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 he wasn't giving me anything new until I started doing what he told me to do. And he won't. If he tells you to do something, don't say, tell me to do something else. No, he's gonna say, do what I told you to do. So anyway, we're at a New Year's Eve party at the House of Prayer of May, at Father Jim Fallon, and up, up comes to me Dr. Max. He says, hey Frank, how you doing? He says, hey Dr. Max, how you doing? He says, I heard you're looking to buy a house. I said, I am. He said, I want to help you with the house. Just like that, just like the Lord told me. Now this is 1977, he gave me $3,000. You know, I paid the closing costs and everything. He said, if you need more money for anything, just let me know. Now if I hadn't heard that, I, even, I didn't even tell my wife about it, I didn't tell nobody about that because I thought I was, who knows? It was a pepperoni pizza I ate last night. <laughs> but that was, and another example of that is um, in 1986, I was working corporately and I had a side business and uh, at a little office in my house. And I sat down for the mail and there was this flyer for this Congress of the Holy Spirit and World Evangelization that was held, being held in New Orleans in the spring. <clears throat> And it had like incredible people. Father Tom Forrest, who was the head of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, Paul Yonggi Cho, the, the pastor of the largest church in Pentecostal church in Korea, Oral Roberts was there, the Lynn brothers were there, John Wimber, who was in the vineyard ministry, they had an incredible ministry in, uh, in, in healing and, and word of knowledge and stuff like that. And I looked at it and I said, man, this would be so much fun, this would be great, and I threw it in the waste paper basket. I said, there's no way I can go to this. The next day I'm sitting in the same desk in my office, and the Lord speaks to my heart. He says, I want you to go to New Orleans. I said, really? I want to go to New Orleans. How do I do that? So I'm going to begin. So there was three things that had to happen. I had to, first of all, get the time off from work. And in the factory situation, we closed down at certain times during the year. So I wanted to get off in April. It was not normal. I went to them, and they said, yeah, yeah, yeah you, you can have that time off. And then I, didn't have, I still didn't have any money for something like that. So we went to the local community we were serving. We said, my brother Chester, of recent memory, God bless him. He's praying for us right now. I can feel his presence. Um, 
Come, Holy Spirit. The heaven and earth are full of your glory. His glory is starting to be manifested right now. Just let, open our eyes, O oh Lord. Open our eyes. But anyway, um, so the community came up with enough money for our airfare, and we needed like one or two nights of hotel, and we stayed with his relatives. He's from New Orleans for a couple nights, so that was taken care of. Then I had to get my wife to agree, and four children. And uh, this is the, this is the flat-out truth. The day I left, we had contracted to put a second floor on our house. There was an old hip roof house, and we put a second floor on it, and they started construction. And the day I went to get the airplane to New Orleans, my wife and four kids looked up the stairs, and there was no roof on the house. If you don't think that is God, I don't know what is. I still don't understand how that happened. I'm sure my wife doesn't understand how it happened either. But when he tells you to do something, he'll, he confirms his word. And that's why he told me, you take it or leave it, Few years ago, he said, would you devote the rest of your life to promoting the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I said, Lord, I had it in 1973. It completely turned my life right side up. I know how important it is. I don't know what you mean. I'll do whatever you want, but I know what you mean. And I'm beginning to understand what he means. What he means is we don't have to go through a lot of pre-evangelization. We simply need to tell the truth in love, do our part. Our part is the equivalent in my pea brain of when they have mass and they're preparing the chalice, the blood, before they consecrate it, a little drop of water goes down into that chalice of blood. By the mystery of this mingling of water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled our, himself to share in our humanity. We, we hear that all the time. We become, Peter says we're partakers of the divine nature. We're not left to our human nature. Oh, they're only human. Well, yeah, we're, we are human and we're in the flesh. But we don't live according to the flesh. We live according to the spirit. We've been translated into the kingdom of his beloved son. We understand what really is happening in the church. We're good people. We love the Lord. We're doing the best we can do. We pray. We do good services. We, we help out with things. All that stuff is wonderful, good. We should be doing all that stuff. All I'm telling you is... Ralph Martin, who's a, a prophet in, in, in the Catholic Church, he was involved in the Catholic Charismatic Renewal from the beginning, I was talking to a lady who was at the, at the uh, retreat where the Catholic Charismatic Renewal first experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the Ark and the Dove uh, uh, retreat house north of Pittsburgh. He said to her, what's happening right now is the power from below has been unleashed. But not to worry, because the power from on high is severely greater than the power from below. We got to get the power from on high. I got to do it. You know, for, you know, I just, Lord, I can't go into the details about it. It's, it's not relevant. It's not important. But the, the freedom that I experience right now, I still have thoughts come to me. They're trying to drag me back into the last prison, the prison I was in. And I have to make a full stop right then and say, Jesus, I take this thought captive in obedience to you. I'm not going to accept it. I demolish that stronghold. I, I'm not kidding with you, folks. We're in a real battle. But Jesus is the victor, and he also says the battle is mine. We've got to understand we're part of this thing, but we're like the little drop of water into the chalice of wine. When the water goes into the wine... Can you tell the difference? When the Father looks at me, he sees me through the blood of Jesus. You know, and, and I, I taught this retreat, and, and I, I, I was saying, it, it struck me about the love of God that not only did, if we confess our sins, is he faithful to forgive our sins? Yay. <laughs> Yay. He also says he puts them as far as the east from the west. That's pretty good. It also says he forgets them. God, has the father got cognitive difficulty? He forgets my sins. But that doesn't, that's not where it ends. Jesus, he who knew no sin for our sake, became sin so that in him we become the very righteousness, old translation before 71, holiness of God. Do you understand? In him we're the righteousness and holiness of God. That's who we really are. I'm not Frank Carica that has made a zillion mistakes in his life, that's hit his head against the wall more than you'd want to know, that had no clue of what I was doing, and I just tried to fill something that made me feel better with it, and none of it worked, until I found out there is something that worked. 
and his name is Jesus, and he communicates to me in the power of the Holy Spirit. You think this is good news? <laughs> I think it's beyond good news. Okay? But we need to bring the word out in the power of his love. Now, I feel like I'm called to, to, to use words. And we all use words. But your call may be something different. Your call may just be to show kindness to people around you. Your, your call may be to go to deep prayer for people, to love them enough to say, Lord, you're going to take care of my stuff. I'm going to take care of whatever you want me to do. That takes courage and that takes trust. Because if you're like me, my, my mentor down in, in Florida, Charlie Osborne, is a late Catholic evangelist. He said, uh, I talked to him several years ago. I said, Charlie, I've come to the conclusion, I says, that everybody's got a full plate. He goes, brother, everybody's got the same plate. Okay, we're all facing, one way or another, we're all facing the same thing. Nobody's got, nobody catches a break on that. <laughs> That's the effect of sin and, and generational sins and stuff like that. But Jesus shattered all that stuff. He broke the power of sin and Satan is in sickness and death. Paul could say, death, where is thy sting? We don't even have to be afraid of death. It comes when it comes. Paul says, better for me to go, but if I got stuff to do, I'll stay. <laughs> that's your attitude, that's what it should be. You know? I got a lot of people I want to party with up there, okay? Communicate with them often. Pray for them and ask them to pray for me. Okay? When I go someplace, I don't go with any of my own ability, because if I'm with my own ability, you guys will stay home and eat pizza and drink beer and watch football. <laughs> be much more effective for you. I come with the intercession of the angels and saints. I come with the intercession of Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And so do we all. Okay? We're all unique. You probably figured out I'm probably a little more unique than most, but <laughs> we're all unique and we all have special gifts. And God has something for Charlie and Wayne and Mike to do that nobody on the face of the earth can do. Everybody. So don't think we're not part of one big body. I, I, I look at God's family, his community is like an Italian big odd salad. We got, you know, somebody brings this, somebody brings that, somebody brings that. Maybe you spice it up with a little prosciutto and you got some nice cheese and you got some real olives, you know, and it becomes better and better and we all put whatever we've got into it. And that's what community is. Jesus is the only one that's got all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He's got the five-fold ministry. Some people have more aspects of the ministry, but Jesus had it all. We as a body approximate it. That's why we're all necessary. You know, people come to our prayer meeting. We've been here having it for 40, it is a 43rd year. Um, and we love when everybody can come. Sometimes they can't come or they come in late. Come when you can come. You've got to leave early, leave early. But it's good because when they're there, there's something special about that. Okay? We'll do fine if you're not there, but we're even finer if you are there. Okay? Do you think the Lord is looking at the church for 70% of the people that have received the Eucharist no longer come there? Do you think he's very, real happy with that? Not because he's judging them. It's because they've cut themselves off from life. The source and summit of our faith, it says in the doctrine. Okay? And 31% of the people go don't even believe that. I said, after I hear Pastor Ayanola teach, he was a, one of the teachers of the retreat I gave too, you know, he's talking about Jesus, you know, God is the source of all healing. And he went through the scriptures and Lords and all sorts of different things. He says, you know, if, Je if Jesus is really in, truly present in, all, in the Blessed Sacrament, every priest ought to be saying, come to our service Sunday morning, we're going to have a healing service. Bring all your needs, your sicknesses, your wants, your desires. Jesus will heal and just go receive him in Holy Communion because he's really there. Is it true or not? Isn't that true? Well, what are we pussyfooting around for? Let's stop apologizing for stuff and let's start asking God for the grace to live it. I know it takes a long time. I know that I'm hoping I wreak less havoc than I used to. I, used to, I know I've wreaked a lot of havoc. But it says, He loved us when we were yet sinners, right? i got to tell him, Lord, I'm a sinner, but I'm trying. You guys still love me, right? <laughs> I'm okay. He's got no problem with, sin's not a problem for it. He forgot it. If we'll, 
confess it. Now, if we know, we, you know, we, we've got remedies for that. We've got our heart, we've got confession, we've got all sorts of things, confess your sins to one another. He doesn't want that to be our, a challenge to us. He doesn't want us to be weighed down with sin. Sin, the scripture says, so easily clings to us. And it clings to us trying to, <clears throat> to bring us down. So we went, to, we went to New Orleans, and many things happened there, but a couple of them I just want to go over. I was going to do this in three weeks, but I really didn't do it in about three months with you. But <laughs> when, we, when we went to New Orleans, uh, John Wimber, who was a, a simple guy, just you know, just had blue blue jeans and a white shirt on. He was he was unchurched when he grew up. He was actually a pretty famous musician. He was in the, the group the Champs with the tequila. Da -da 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 -da. He played saxophone and he arranged. He was pretty famous. They were starting to make it big. The Lord Lord got him, and he just really was open to signs and wonders. He's a, this was the first meeting, or the second meeting six months later, a general congress. This was for leaders of 40 denominations in the Superdome. Everybody had been speaking. Yeah, Paul Yonke Cho spoke, Father, Father Tom Forrest spoke. It's time for John Wimber to come up. He comes up to the microphone and he goes, I'm sorry, the Lord hasn't given me anything. <laughs> and he sat down. I said, what? What is this? Now, it seemed like forever, but it wasn't forever. The Lord gave him something. When he came up to the microphone, wind, wind swept through the whole Superdome. Chester was there. You can attest test to it. When you see him in heaven, tell him. They'll tell you. <laughs> Tommy, Mary Lou McDonald, they're in heaven. You can ask them. But Sister Bridget was there, too, and you can ask her. Because we just had lunch a couple of weeks ago, and she said, I was there, too. You remember? I said, yeah, you told me that. I didn't see you there. But she saw it. And people just started... He's screaming, and he says, don't worry, this is the Lord is just setting him free. Mm -hmm. It was a sovereign act of God. Because mm -hmm. he waited on the Lord, and he, get, he said what God had him to say. How, how good was that? Then we went to the side conference that was on healing, and in the third session, it was in a ballroom down in a, 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 a hotel down from the Superdome, and Wimber gets up, and he says, it was packed. And Wimber says, every once in a while, the Lord tells me the anointing that I've got, which is an anointing for healing and signs and wonders, he's going to give to people, but don't seek it if, unless you're doing it for the right reason, because it can be detrimental to you. And I'm, I'm agonizing over this. Lord, do you want me to do this? Should I do this? Is this be, am I doing it for me? Do you want me to do it? And I've been praying Psalm uh, 95 for, for a number of months. Not Psalm 95. Anyway, create me a, Psalm 51, create me a clean heart, O Lord. Okay. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of my salvation. And this is exactly what happened. I'm standing there, eyes closed, mulling over this, and I never saw her, but a lady came up and tapped me on the right shoulder, and she said, don't worry, brother, the Lord's, Lord's given you a clean heart. Which gave me the courage to say, Yes, and however I said that. It was just an emotion, I think. I don't even know if I used words. And the room went into travail. And I lost complete surrounding of everything. I had no awareness of it, just like when I was baptized in the Spirit. And I had an intellectual vision, I think they call it. I saw God as I saw. I knew it was God, and I noticed people were below, and there was like a steel plate in between. And the Lord says, I'm lamenting, because I have all these graces I've already poured forth, which are not being reached by my people who are desperate for them, because there's this interference. He says, the interference, <clears throat> this is what he told me, was because of those in authority weren't exercising authority properly. And I knew it wasn't just hierarchical authority, although it was hierarchical authority. It's the authority of the believer, the authority of the husband, the authority of the wife, <clears throat> all sorts of different believers, our authority of teachers. But... Grace has started to penetrate that a little bit, okay? And in a Lutheran conference at the same time, somebody had ex almost the exact same vision, and it started breaking up more, and they said it had to do with the northeast or east part of the United States. Uh, August 3rd, 30th, 2003, I had just lost my corporate job, and I went into a sales job. I had a corporate job with a corporate salary, which was decent, 
And I had always done sales, and you know, I went through a whole discernment process. And I went into a job where I, did, I went into straight commission sales. <laughs> I learned a lot about myself. And I did really great for about the first seven weeks, sold my, my first appointment out. And then I, then, I, then I went cold for seven weeks. And I'd be driving, I'd be driving the appointments, not only crying from my heart, but crying, tears. I was just being brutalized. I was being, you know, I was being crushed. You know, Scripture says, we can't be crushed too fine or you can't make bread out of it. And I said to the Lord along the way, are we close to being done? He says, no, we're just getting started. <laughs> that was one crushing, okay? Uh, my wife and my daughter wanted to go to the state fair. I went with them. I'm sure it wasn't much company. And I'm walking down the fairway, feeling like the only thing I wanted was a big hole I could crawl in and die. And I hear God speak to me the way I hear him. He says, revival in upstate New York. And I, honest to God, I, I, my, remember, my remembrance of it, I think I stopped, I took my hand and shook it up to the sky and I, I cursed God. I want to say the words I said to him. And I said, what are you talking about? And then I, I thought about it again and I apologized. <laughs> I said, Father, I, what do you want? He said, I want you to ask me for it. Because I can do that. Father, give us revival in upstate New York. Mother Day Dean had a group of intercessors and they prayed for people, individuals, they prayed for communities, they prayed for nations, they prayed for governments, they prayed for the church, and whatever God wanted them to pray about. And one day in late 80s, 89 exact, they were praying for Germany. And they had this image, and they knew it was Germany, and they had this image of a wall. Now, of course, at that point, the Berlin Wall was up. And so they asked the Lord, he says, Lord, is this the Berlin Wall? And he said, yes, it is. He said, well, what do you want us to do? He says, my father wants the wall to come down. Ask him for it. They said, Father, would you bring this wall down? Two days later, the wall came down. Now, she said in context, this was the culmination of all the sacrifices and prayers that went for probably many years to get to that point of freedom. But the intercessors had the privilege, because they trusted in God and they laid it all on his feet and listened to him, it's like somebody plants the seed, somebody waters it, sometimes you've got to put some stuff onto it, somebody prunes it. Somebody's got to pick the grapes. In intercession, we do parts of that, but sometimes you get a chance to pick the grapes. Okay? Now, I know some of you will, and I know we've all got stuff we're dealing with. Okay? And I, I know that it's all perfect for us because we count it your joy, brothers and sisters, when every trial comes our way. Oh, Heavenly Father, when I was preparing for this retreat up in Syracuse, um, it always happens, you get a spiritual attack, and I, you know, I've done it for 40 years, I understand what that is. In this particular ca case, it was very, very pointed and, and pretty severe, and, and it, it, it worked at all my weak points. I know I'm the only one in the room that has weak points. <laughs> and you know, instead of and this is why I know that I've come to a different place. Instead of being mad about it, instead of being embarrassed about it, ashamed about it, uh, grumble about it, I just went to my lovely Heavenly Father and I said, Heavenly Father, I thank you that the end of me I sold just told me all the areas you've got to help me in. His power is made perfect in weakness. We cannot, we cannot be afraid of our weaknesses. Now, the weaknesses that are sinful, we want to be translated out of those things. Okay? And we hide them. We hide them. We're still hiding them. In fact, on February 15th of 2003, he said, My son's strongholds begin to form, not when you sin, but when you hide your sin, when shame and guilt lead not to repentance but denial. I'm just telling you, Daddy, Abba, knows all about it already. What do you think he is, stupid? Just because he forgot my sins doesn't mean he doesn't know things. He knows everything. And, and, and I've got to stop being embarrassed about my weaknesses where I can't bring it to him for healing. Because who's, who's needling that in me? It's not the spirit of the living God. It's not Jesus Christ. It's not Daddy God. It's the world, the flesh, or the devil. I don't care which one it is. In fact, the world of the devil are really easier to take on than, than me, <laughs> my flesh. The world of the devil, my flesh. Hearing, 
Those things were within me. That's why we need somebody else to pray with and to give us the counsel and the etc. So they can give us a perspective because sometimes we're so darn close to the thing we can't get our emotions out of the way. There's nothing wrong with emotions, but they can cloud. Okay, we got Mother Nadine says we always got to get it into neutral so we can hear God. I don't know if this is making any sense to you guys, but this has made a lot of sense to me. Um, Jesus says, I do nothing on my own, but I only say what the Father taught me, because I always do what is pleasing to him. So what I say, I say as the Father told me. A son cannot do anything on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing, for what he does, the son will also do. Jesus took his complete cue from Daddy God, because he heard him, and he said what he heard Father say, and he saw what he was doing, and he did what he saw Father doing. But he also said, in another place, it's the Father that works, does the works within me. Then in another place it says, as I'm in the Father and the Father's in me, I'm in you and you're in me. Those are good words, are they not? We're temples of the Holy Spirit. The Trinity lives within us. And yet we have small thoughts about things. I'm facing some stuff for years and years and years. I could not comprehend how I could get past these things. Because on my own strength, I would never, ever got past them. I'd be little with them until the day I died. But he's showing me, I don't have to if I let him come in and lead me. If you live by the Spirit in Galatians, you certainly won't gratify the desires of the flesh. That's why the Spirit is so incredibly important. We'll talk more about that next week. So... Uh, it's the Father then in Jesus is within us and the Father's in him. The Father's in us. And then why don't we just do the things we hear the Father say and we do, do the things we see the Father doing and, and say the things the Father is saying to us. That's what the saints did. Now, I don't know how, how far along on that continuum we can get. Maybe we'll become like novices. We probably always are beginners. But some people get a little bit better on it, at it. And then we need to use all these things that we can build up ourselves in faith so that we can build up the body of Christ in faith. Okay? Set your hearts on love and eagerly seek after the spiritual gifts. I think in your own life, was there any time you went after anything eagerly? It wasn't casual. I mean, there's lots of examples. I sorely wanted to be on our junior varsity basketball team. And they were a team that went on to win section six. These guys were good. Some of them went on to college and we're headed to the pros. And uh, they were way beyond me, but I love to play basketball. Mm -hmm. And it was the final night of tryouts, and I knew they were gonna make the final cut that night. And man, I went at after every loose ball, I took every shot I could do, I tried to block everything I could, and the coach probably looked at me and says, boy to boy wants it, I can let him on the team. I only got in one game, shot two free throws, all net. <laughs> but I got to practice with him, I got to travel with him, I got to see them play. I went after that eagerly. I mean, that's just one example. You could probably do the same thing. Especially that you should prophesy. I knew that scripture for decades, but it wasn't until about three years ago that I really paid attention to two, three sentences later. A prophet encourages, consoles, and upbuilds the body of Christ. And we're priests, prophets, and kings. I won't read it from you, the Catholic Catechism, but it says that. He, wa he wants us to do that. People have encouraged me, and we should be encouraging one another. I ha I've had people come from all over the place, and again, I may be a little tougher nut to crack than most. I really, you know, a lot of self love. Okay, and that's my spiritual director told me five years ago. He says, "You're good here, you're good there, a lot of wisdom." He says, "But you rely too much on yourself, and you don't have enough courage." I said, "Oh." What can I do about that? 68 years, and I don't know, I don't know about that. I didn't know about that. I don't know anything to do about it. But Jesus reminded me that his power is made perfect in weakness. I said, oh, I had a light bulb go off. I don't know how to work up my courage muscles, Lord. I got an idea. Just give me yours. It's already full. It's perfectly formed. I need yours. I don't need mine. I can't do it. I, I'm relying too much on myself. He says, my spiritual, 
level one and level three are good, and level two you got a lot of problems with. But anyway, so I said, Lord, would you just give me the grace to rely on you? Well, see, you Walsh taught us that in Philadelphia. He said, he called it the spirituality of gift. If you think God is calling you to something or asking something of you, don't try and figure out how to do it. Take a step back and say, Lord, would you give me the grace to do this thing? So if any of this stuff is making any sense whatsoever, ask the Lord in your prayer this week, Lord, show me what I need to implement in my life to have greater freedom so I can go to the next level of freedom so then I can go to the next level of freedom. And I can get out of this dark place and out of this dark place. I want to get out of that field where there's the sunshine and green grass, waterfalls, Jesus is sitting on the, on, the, on the wall, and I can go over and I sit, sit, sit down with him and talk with him a little bit. That's what he's calling us to. One day we were believe we're going to be in heaven. We think it's going to be magic. Remember what I was saying for our study through Father Maximilian. St. Bernard said, Where, what burns in hell is self-will. If we die with no self-will, there's nothing to burn. Every day, every trial, every challenge, every distress we have is another opportunity our lovely Heavenly Father has given us to divest ourselves and surrender our self-will and say, your will be done and not mine. Isn't that what Jesus said? And just to let you know about that, St. Catherine of Siena, who was a doctor of the church, said, in the garden, where people say, Jesus is asking the Father, if you can, if you can not make me go to the cross, I wish, you could, I wish you could take that away. She said, Jesus wasn't weak in any way. That's not what he was saying. He'd already set his face like Jerusalem toward, toward the cross. He knew he came to do his Father's will. She said what he was saying was, if you can keep this demonic oppression that's trying to keep me from going to the cross off me, I'd like to have that off me. It's a whole different read on it, isn't it? And Jesus, when he ministered on the face of the earth, did not minister as God. He was always God. True God and true man. But Philippians said, he didn't deem equality with God something to be grasped at, but he laid down his rights. When he went into the Jordan after his 30 years being a carpenter or whatever he was, and the Holy Spirit came upon him, and the Holy Spirit led him out into the desert, that's when he began his ministry. He ministered as the Son of Man empowered by the Holy Ghost. Ran, right. Son of Man, empowered by the Holy Ghost. Same Holy Spirit. He doesn't ration the Spirit. We need Pentecost every day. Wait in Jerusalem. Until a power from on high comes on you. We're in the New Jerusalem. We're linear thinking. Pentecost happened in the Old Testament. They, it was written on, the law was written on the stones. It would happen on the day of Pentecost when the law was written in our hearts. We know uh, it can't, you know, it, confirmation, we had a re renewal of that. We need it every day. If today you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We ain't got nothing but today. If we're lucky enough, to, there's a tomorrow, we'll have to day today and tomorrow. And I'm not saying you get everything in that particular day, but I'm telling you, I'm well aware of things that I have missed and didn't cooperate with in, the, in that today that caused damage to me and my family into the community. I had enough of it. Time to tell you the truth. Now, I don't know how well I'm going to live this out. I'm asking God to give me the grace to live it out. But we as a community can help one another. Because I know some of you, and I know how your hearts are set on the Lord, and know how you're trying to follow Him, and you're listening to Him. And I think, I asked him, somebody asked me, who should, who, who should we invite? I said, Lord, I told, bring the ones you want. And looking out here, there's a lot of people that if I would have said, Lord, I think there's some of the ones you want, they're here. It's not by accident, okay? Prayerful people. Been at it a long time, okay? But maybe just not believing that it could happen. Could we really have revival? Could we really have a, a change in our culture? 
You want to stop abortion? Change the culture where people don't have to be. And I'm not making any judgment on women that have abortion. I think abortion, I stand with it, it's life from conception. But you, you tell me there's a 60 year old girl that gets impregnated by a guy that has no responsibility whatsoever, and her parent kicks her out of the house and she's got no money, and she has to make a decision. The church should step in and help her. It's not happening. Some places it is. I can't judge that. You don't know the pressures I've been at because of the call in my life when the devil has tried to kill me many times. I should have been dead several times, honest to God. I was so stupid. <laughs> I'm glad he's slow to anger and he's rich in mercy. I don't know if you can relate to that. But wherever we're at right now, I believe that we can, because we have the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the power of the Eucharist, we have the power of the sacrament of reconciliation, we have the power of the sacrament of the sick, we have the power of prayer, and I don't care what kind of prayer you use, we ought to do everything in the Spirit. Pray the Rosary in the Spirit, pray the Eucharist in the Spirit, pray the Scriptures in the Spirit, pray silence in the Spirit, pray in tongues, which is the aspect of praying in the Spirit. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Some of you have gifted tongues. You haven't just got it right in the car, right? <laughs> just happened. I came, my sister got baptized in the Spirit down here in 1974. She went up and told my parents, Sicilian parents, went to church and all the good side of stuff. Never heard about any of this. My dad died, died at 99 and a half. He just started speaking in tongues spontaneously. That's how he was. Simple hearted guy, best in the best sense. My mother was a little more intellectual. She was an intercessor. She had to go, she was in church praying for somebody else, and all of a sudden she just found herself different. I can tell you a hundred examples of different ways gifts come. But they'll come to you. Louise got it because she called a, a prayer hotline and a woman encouraged her, right? Louise, I was talking to her about it for months. I didn't want to go too hard with her. But all of a sudden, this other lady stepped in and she got it for her and helped her to get it. We're too far down the road, folks, not to get everything that we can use. And if he gives you something and he puts something really on your heart and you want to use that kind of prayer, do it with all your heart. I pray the rosary every day. I love the rosary. I think it's powerful, powerful. But I also pray in tongues every day. Last story, and I'll call it, because I told you to get out of here at 8.15. There was a guy in uh, England in the beginning of the last century. Uh, uh, talk about this here. Smith Wigglesworth. He was a plumber. Plumbing was just coming into existence, and he was make, doing really good. He was a good plumber, and he was making a lot of money. His wife was a minister, and he went to this Episcopal uh, session they had, I don't know what it was, a meeting, and uh, he got filled with the Holy Spirit and started speaking in tongues, okay? He went off, and he had this ministry that went to every, all continents, and there were 24 or 25 documented examples of people who were being raised from the dead in his ministry. Pretty good ministry, okay? And so they asked him one day, uh, what's the secret of your ministry? He says, well, if, if you ask me what the secret is, he says, I went to this Episcopal thing, I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I, I got to speak in other tongues. I go in my room every afternoon for two hours and I pray in tongues, because he who prays in the tongues edifies himself, build himself up in faith, in faith. And then at night I go out and I edify other people. Before a retreat two, three years ago, the Lord told me before my doing that, besides the prayer discipline he had given me, to pray in tongues two hours every day before that retreat. And I said, <laughs> well, I guess if it's you, it'll last. If it's not, it'll last one day. And he gave me the grace to do that for about three or four weeks before and several weeks afterwards. And I don't do that much but I now, but I, I've been doing more than I had been. But the Lord just reminded me the other day. He says, you think I told you that for, for no good reason? I said, no, Lord, you told me that for a reason. Because I thought that I had to, figure out how to do it. I can't figure out how to do anything. If Daddy tells me to do something, I just got to say, yes, sir, help me. I don't know. That's what Jesus did. He just said, we heard the Father say, he did what he saw, saw the Father do. You think we can do just a little bit of that together in this community and we can see the Holy Spirit come in and start setting people free? Making people believe, believe that Jesus is real in the Eucharist? That Jesus is real? University study named the ten greatest living people. Nobody said Jesus. Firstborn from the dead. He's alive. He's real. 
He's not a myth. He's not some great teacher. He's God. The Father's God. The Holy Spirit's God. I know it's a mystery. They're three in one. I, I, they all have different voices, too. You can start to, you can know when the Father's talking to you. You can know when Jesus is talking to you. You can know when the Spirit's talking to you. I don't know it real, real good, but I started to discern the Father's voice about seven years ago, and he doesn't talk to me as much as the Spirit does, but he does talk to me. Now, I, I'm putting it all on the line. I bet the farm on this. This is either real, or when I die, I'll be very disappointed. But I don't care at this point. I don't think there's any other game in town. And when we get to the point where we're not holding anything back, we're not ashamed of our weaknesses, we're not embarrassed because we failed so many times, and we just said, the love of God is greater than anything, anything can throw at you. Come back next week. We'll talk some more. Okay. <laughs>